Welcome. My name is Benjamin Percy. I'm an assistant professor in the English department, and it's my pleasure tonight to introduce Peter Hedges. Uh, special thanks to the、uh, committee on lectures check, with special check, funding from one, GSB,、two. and to the English department, and to to Peter for coming out here、uh, for free to talk with us. Thanks very much. There's a moment in Pieces of April when Bobby runs up the stairs of their apartment complex to tell April that her parents have finally arrived for Thanksgiving. He's been missing for hours. He's been beaten and bloodied, but his love for her is so strong that it shines through his expression and melts away all of April's worries and frustration. This is the quintessential Peter Hedges moment. When his characters smile at us through a bloodied lip, they are all so beautifully injured. From Arnie, the mentally challenged boy in What's Eating Gilbert Grape, who has a habit of climbing water towers and forgetting how to get back down, to Dan, the widowed advice columnist who lusts after his brother's girlfriend, the characters who inhabit the work of Peter Hedges are so real because of their faults. All of them misfits, speaking to us from the margins of life, hurt and hopeful and deeply human. No matter if we love or despise them, we can look to them as models of possibility, as what we hope to become or avoid becoming. In this way, Hedges is as much an artist as he is a scientist of human behavior. Of everyday life, carefully observed, Hedges' accomplishments are legion. As a novelist, playwright, and filmmaker, his first novel, *What's Eating Gilbert Grape*, was the basis for the 1993 film, which he also wrote. It starred Johnny Depp and Leonardo DiCaprio in his breakout role, who was nominated then for an Academy Award. His other novels include *An Ocean in Iowa* and *The Heights*, published this March. Hedges was co-writer for the screenplay adaptation of Jane Hamilton's *A Map of the World*, starring Sigourney Weaver and Julianne Moore, and for his work on Nick Hornby's *About a Boy*, he was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Adapted Screenplay. He made his feature film directorial debut with *Pieces of April*, starring Katie Holmes and Patricia Clarkson. And in 2007, he directed and co-wrote *Dan in Real Life*, starring Steve Carell and Juliette Binoche. Hedges has taught at Yale, Bennington College, and the North Carolina School of the Arts. He has served as a creative advisor to the Sundance Screenwriters Lab and been awarded residencies at Yaddo, the McDowell Colony, and the Malay Colony. And though he now lives in Brooklyn, he still calls himself, and will still claim him, as an Iowan, as he grew up in West Des Moines. But what's most important about Peter Hedges? Is not the long list of accolades; it's the way he masterfully tells a story, so that as we grow to know the people in his books and films, we find out something more about ourselves. Welcome. Him. I'm afraid the evening is going to go way downhill from that. <laughs> Would you speak at my funeral? Honestly, <laughs> that was great. I, I believe it's true that、um, the Gettysburg Address,、uh, the the guy who spoke, I read that Gary Will's book, but after.、Uh, Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address was more of an introduction to the afternoon, and then this man spoke for two hours.、And、of course, Lincoln read the Gettysburg Address, and the guy just went, "Oh no!" You know, <laughs> two hours of nothing, and what we were—that th may be the best part of the night. Anyway, thank you so much. I'm very、uh, appreciative of those kind words. I I'm thrilled to be here、uh, to talk with you tonight.、Um, You know, when you ever you do something like this, you just hope it's helpful and useful.、Um, it, it's useful at a time like this. If nothing that is uttered tonight illuminates anything for you, 
you just just get a nice nap and 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 you know carry on honestly my intention is to be helpful to be i loved the phrase model of possibility it is it's one of my favorite notions this that you know to be a model of possibility the other opportunity here for me is to be a model of what not to be so so th you could also, you know, take some of what I tell you and go, okay, I'm not doing that. And, and, and so in a sense, I realize I can be useful to you by disappointing you in every conceivable way. <laughs> and because that's the case, I, I feel absolutely liberated. Um, anyway, uh, the, this is to be a lecture. It's a difficult thing because I don't lecture. I, I've... I, I just, I, it's not in my lexicon of things I do. But I do think I could tell you a bit of my story. I, um, so many of you are from Iowa. How many of you grew up, uh, were born in Iowa that are here? Oh, see, this is rocking my world. <laughs> okay. I know there's a fine young man here from Nebraska. That would be Andy with the fine name. Uh, anyone out where, uh, anybody from Nebraska? Okay, a couple. Lovely. Lovely to have you in our state. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, so I, I come from where you, most of you come from, or where some of you w wish you would come from. And uh, I, when, I, when I was in college, I uh, never thought I would write novels. I never, I, I wasn't conscious of dreaming of being a filmmaker, but, but I knew I wanted to be in the theater. I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be Johnny Depp. You can see how well that worked out for me. Uh, but um, I didn't know Johnny Depp at the time. I just wanted to have Johnny Depp's career, which I think is the perfect film career that any actor could ever have. But anyway, that didn't work out so well. But when I was younger, when I, w when I was your age, I wanted to be... How old are you, may I ask? Okay, you rock my world. You're my favorite person here. I just <laughs> want to say that right now. You're adorable. Nine years old. Do you know I can't read half of what I was going to read now because you're here? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Why are you here? Okay. Now, this is, this is why we live. Okay, here's the deal. Don't be a movie director for about 20 years. I think I've got 20 good years left. Don't take any jobs from me, all right? When I retire, which may be soon, you're welcome to go at it. But until then, and do you know something else? I'm going to tell you something. This is the truest thing I know. And I learned this from Sanford Meisner. He was my acting teacher. He was a brilliant teacher. This, this is going to freak you out, okay? Because I said I'm going to direct 20 more years. But you and I, we're going to get it down tonight. We're happening, okay? In a way that is just, I, I, I'm so excited right now. In fact, no one else is here. It's you and me, okay? For now. Then I'm going to open it up. But right now it's us. Anyway, he, he and this, this is what I was going to build to, so this is a real problem. Like what I drive to my, to my non-lecture lecture, because lecture, actually this is all scripted, everything, every word I've said. You are an actor I hired. Did you know that? I, I do need you to speak a little louder like we did in rehearsal earlier. <laughs> You know, we all have that feeling, what if everything is a movie in our head? What if we are the galaxy? And that's kind of cool to think you're in my movie. Because I, I really, I didn't imagine all of you, but it worked out good. Anyway, okay. But here's the truth. Anything this teacher said to me, he said, Peter, do you want to be a good actor? I said, no, 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 I want to be a writer. Okay. Do you want to be a good writer? Yes. Do you want to be an artist of life? Do you want to learn how to love? All good things, right? Doesn't that sound good? Maybe learn how to love isn't really high on your list right now. Believe me, in about five or six years, you're going to want to learn how to love. Okay? <laughs> Trust me, that's how God worked it out, and it's brilliant. Okay? <laughs> but anyway, so are we with it? Do you want to be an artist? you want to be a writer? Whatever it is. Whatever it is you want to do well. Whatever that is, 20 years. I said, I'm sorry. He said, No. Anything worth doing well will take you 20 years to learn. And then he said, and in your case, Peter, maybe 21. 
And um, I, I've actually found that to be true. Uh, I've been a, a writer uh, for 25 years, and it turned out I, I actually felt it about my 21st year. I was beginning to get a little kind of getting the hang of it. And that didn't, doesn't mean you won't necessarily have a little success or get some attention. You may not have that, but, and you also may, you know, people may go, wow, you're really good. But this great man said to me, anything worth doing well will take you 20 years to learn, maybe 21. And when I was your age and I heard that, that was really, to my surprise, it was a really liberating concept because it meant... Well, particularly now in this culture where everything's fast and, and information travels quickly and, and, and we want things, everything's microwaved and, 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 you know, it happens quickly. Here came along a great man with a brilliant teacher who's one of the great acting teachers of all time who said, you can want it now, you can't have it now. It's going to take you 20 years. And, and it wasn't just, you know, he wasn't saying stay alive for 20 years. He was saying work every day for 20 years. And it turned out, I, I talked to him more, I said, where did you come up with this concept? And he said, you know, that as a kid he trained to be a classical pianist. And anyone who, you know, works so hard at uh, something that takes so much time and skill knows that it's practice. It's hours and hours of practice. So, anyway, now that you're all thinking I've got 20 years and you're thinking, well, if I've got 20 years, can we go out for pizza or do something? You know, maybe that's a good idea. But just stay with me. I'm going to go back a bit and tell you some of my story, and then I'd really love to get to questions. I may read a little. In fact, you know what? I'm going to just – this is this is kind of an impressionistic jazz kind of evening. <laughs> I, I'm going to I'm going to read a little, little piece from the book, just a little bit. Um, and then, then I'm going to start and tell you a bit of my story, which I hope is helpful. And uh, anyway, this novel, which I've written, I worked on for 12 years. Uh, and it's a story of a marriage set in Brooklyn Heights, uh, where I live, uh, or lived, I live nearby now. And the interesting thing about Brooklyn Heights, which you wouldn't know if you don't know New York City, m many people in New York don't even know this, it's actually a small town. And it's uh, the first, it's considered America's first suburb. It's in a beautiful, beautiful area in Brooklyn. In fact, n not that I'm at this caliber, but at, in their prime, Norman Mailer, Truman Capote, Arthur Miller, Henry Miller, Carson McCullers, the list goes on, Nabokov. The list of writers who lived in the Heights is astonishing. And um, it's just, a, it's a really beautiful, beautiful area. And, and if you're a parent of a small child, as the two narrators in my book are, you uh, know everybody who has kids. And so, in, in a weird way, even though this is my third novel and the first one not set in Iowa, it, it, I think I was drawn to writing about the Heights because of that small town feel where your actions have consequences. And um, I tend to like a write, to write about communities where if you mess up, and, and I do and I thought you said it better than I can, I do tr attempt to write stories about well-intended people who just, they, they, they're doing the best they can and sometimes they don't necessarily do what they should. I, we were joking today, my sister's in town and I'm staying with my drama teachers from high school and we're joking about what a story would be like if people only did the right thing. And I kind of tried to narrate the story about the good person who wakes up and does everything right. And it's pretty boring. You know, you, you really do not want to read the book about somebody who does everything right. In fact, I think I'm going to try to write it and then sell it as a sleep aid so that you read it. It was just an idea I just had, actually, I think. But unfortunately, I told you, and someone's going to do it and make a lot of money, and I won't have done it, and I'll be bitter next time I'm back here. Anyway, this is just a short section. Tim is a history teacher, and um, this is probably all I'll read from the book, but we'll see how it goes. Um, Tim, whenever I give, say, my annual lecture on the Gettysburg Address, when I dress up like Lincoln or recount the Cuban Missile Crisis from Castro's point of view, and whenever my students clap and cheer as I exit the classroom 
And after I climb the school stairs to my cork-lined faculty office slash cubby, where I sit in my broken oak swivel chair, my heart racing, exhausted but elated from my brief dance with brilliance, and just as I'm about to announce to myself, I am the god of all teachers. I usually have the good sense to do the following. I pull open my desk drawer, rummage through the assorted chewed-on pens and pencils, the packages of post-its, the pair of le green-handled lefty scissors, the loose change, and the leftover Halloween candy pilfered from one of the boys' orange plastic pumpkins until the aging envelope is found. Ah, I sigh, as I take out the single piece of crinkled, now yellowed paper and reread what a former student uh, wrote a few years back. Mr. Welch... Your, misspelled Y-O-R-E, my favorite, misspelled F-A-V-E-R-I-T-E, teacher ever. I don't care what anybody else, misspelled E-L-S, says. The writer of this note, who for obvious legal reasons will remain nameless, was not learning disabled, dyslexic, or a product of the oft-maligned New York City public school system. He was one of Montague's own. He is at present in his junior year at a swanky private Northeastern college. His major? Elementary education. <laughs> Soon he'll be teaching children, maybe yours. That day, the above note failed to bring me back to earth. I was flying high, and for good reason. Each class had gone better than the class before, culminating with sixth grade American history, where I somehow pulled off a dazzling deconstruction of Francis Scott Key's lyrics for the Star-Spangled Banner, managing vividly to set the scene, shape the context, and in 44 minutes turn 18 sullen sixth graders into patriots. I'd lost all sense of time since that class, my last of the day, and now I sat in my office. What now? What next? I snatched up my office phone, hit nine for an outside line, and punched the numbers that connected me home. There the phone rang, and Kate answered on the third ring, and I started to tell of my triumph, only to be interrupted by Kate's squeal. It's Daddy, she said. She handed the phone to Sam, who said something indecipherable. But by his tone, it was clear something big had happened, something worth celebrating. So I said, good, that's so good, Sammy. And Sam got more excited, babbling at a higher pitch. And I was cheering now. For what exactly? I didn't know. But it was good. Life was, yes, wee-haw. And then I said, let me talk to Mommy. Kate came on the other line, and so what if my good news was aborted, soon to be topped by Kate, who had quite a story to tell? So what if I'd left my guts on the classroom floor? So what? Did you get any of that? Kate asked. Jesus, no, I said. Tell me. And she did. History had been made moments earlier. When Sam woke up from some form of group family nap in the living room, wandered down our narrow hallway, stripped off pants and diaper, climbed up the helper step, sat on the toilet, and produced all by himself a single, perfectly proportioned poop. <laughs> Kate was ecstatic recounting every step along the way, telling how Sam had told her as he'd pointed to the toilet, Mommy, look what I made. I had to laugh. Yes, I was calling because I'd had a triumph too. And while it wasn't literally poop, <laughs> it was a kind of metaphorical poop all the same. Are you crying, honey? Kate asked. She can always tell by the way my voice gets softer, the long, odd pauses between words. You know I am. Hurry home, okay? We won't flush until you get here. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to have a, a little confession I've only told once. I told this last night. The, the, whenever you write a book about a marriage and, and you're married and it's set in the neighborhood where you live, and you live in the neighborhood where you live, people, because they, I believe, suffer from a lack of imagination sometimes, imagine that what you've written isn't fiction. You call it a novel, but they're convinced that it actually happened. 
And I don't know if it's something in our culture that's very obsessed with it being real. And if it happened, then, then it somehow has more import. Uh, but th- I, I did write a, f- a fictional book. I, d- I didn't want to write a memoir about my marriage because I thought it would be nice if I stayed married. Um, <laughs> and uh, also, fiction, and this isn't a knock on anyone who writes memoir. Me- memoir's a wonderful form and, and important. Uh, but for me, f- fiction is a gas. Uh, I, I think what could happen is often so much more interesting than what did. Um, and so I wrote a book that uh, was something I could imagine happening to someone like me or someone like you. You know, good people doing their best, maybe getting a little lost. Um, but the truth be told, th- this moment of the, the poop and the look, look what I made, I, I'm going to confess that there are three overt autobiographical moments in this book, and I just read one of them. But I want to tell you the moment, because many of you write or dream of writing, and one of the thrills when you write is that moment when you first hold the book, uh, when it's all typeset and it's bound and it arrives. And... Uh, I've had that experience three times. I've been writing for 25 years, and in that time I've written three, no- three novels. And um, my second novel was called An Ocean in Iowa. And when it arrived, after seven years of work, I was at my office, and it was a very... It's, it's, it's still, even, even with the heights, it's, it's, it's just a wonderful moment when you hold it. I mean, then you immediately go, is anyone going to read it? And, and is this just going to be a paperweight in someone's home? But, but there's that moment where you go, oh my gosh, I did it. And every time I've received a book that I wrote, the three times, I was always alone. And so it's this quiet moment, and then you, you immediately go, who, who, who can I share this with? I mean, this, and Gilbert Grape, I wasn't uh, even married. But and my, my, when I got it, my fiancé was away, so I went to FedEx and sent it to her. Uh, but in this instance, uh, with Ocean Iowa, now I had a book, and... I had a family. I have, uh, at the time, my son was four and my younger son was two. And the book came, and my office is a little apartment a few blocks from where I live. So I walk to work, go to work, and I had the book. And I went, this is amazing. I, I got to go share it. I'm going to go share it. So I took it out and, you know, clutched it. And I didn't want anyone to see it until my family saw it. And I'm going out. Not that anybody, like the people were waiting outside, you know. <laughs> don't, don't ask me what I have. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so top secret. But I went outside and it had started to rain, which I thought was per I thought, oh God and I, we are we are down together. It's raining. I had a sweatshirt on, so I tucked it up and I'm running through Brooklyn Heights like a fullback with my book. I can't believe it. I, and I'm running and I get home and I unlock the door of our apartment, open the door, and my wife is running down the hall. Oh my, you can't believe it, you can't believe it. I go, what, what, what? Come, come here, come here, come here. And I go running down the hall, you know, holding my book. And I go down, and my, my younger son is standing in the bathroom, you know, diaperless. He'll just love that I'm telling you this. But we all wore diapers once, and we all may wear them again. Um, but the point is, sorry, I'm, I've really, I've got a whole new jag of Depends humor that is, uh, I know karmically I'm going to be struck by something very soon and just be wearing a diaper all the time, and that, that'll be beautiful. Um, it's a time saver. Anyway, uh, sorry. Anyway, so I go, I go running in, and there is my, um, my son, and of course he's pointing at the toilet, and he says, Daddy, look what I made. And of course the first thing we make is poop. I mean, that's what we do. We do that really well. We all do, we're all experts. We're artists of poop. I know you probably never thought of that, but we, that's something we all have in common. Within the last 24 hours, unless some of you's got some problem that you need to address, <laughs> we've all made some poop. So anyway, sorry, I'm really going scatological. Something about Ames made me feel I could go there. Tomorrow night, Iowa City, I will never know. They wouldn't get this. It's the agriculture part of this, you know. Anyway, sorry. Um, but anyway, you know, he said, look what I made. And I, I didn't know what to do. I was like, that's fantastic. It's fantastic. But, you know, I'm, 
my wife's like, what, what's wrong with you? You know, because I'm holding, and I, and I just went, um, well, look what I made. <laughs> so so I, the wonderful thing about writing is I was, you know, in this instance, I was able to take a story and, and, and I think actually in some ways improve it, but, but you know, kind of turn it. But, but I'm a fiction writer and I'm a big advocate for the imagination. I think it's, uh, it's really wonderful to, uh, it's crazy to say, but I, I basically go to a sweet little apartment in Brooklyn every day and I make stuff up. That's what I do. And a uh, friend of mine here from high school, a good buddy, he's a doctor. Doctors are very important people. I love doctors. My brother-in-law is a doctor. They change lives. You know, I hope my stories are useful. I'm definitely not trying to waste your time. But I make stuff up. It's kind of crazy. But I want to talk a little bit about how I got where I got. Because while everybody's journey is unique, there are some things that may be helpful to you in my story. Because basically, my, my story, in a nutshell, is a series of repeated failures. I mean, basically... Failure upon failure, and, and if, if I tell it well, and I'll try to tell it quickly so we can get to questions, hopefully I will be a model of possibility, and you will be able to go when you find yourself in a situation where everything feels to be in flames, you'll say, ah, I knew a guy who everything collapsed, and, and look what happened. Because sometimes the best thing that can happen to you is the thing that you don't want to have happen. So basically, when I was your age, I wanted to be this actor. And I did everything I could to be an actor. I studied. I was in every play. I, I took dance classes, singing classes, everything. But I went off to a drama school because I, I knew so much that I wanted to do theater that I didn't even want to get a liberal arts education. I went to a trade school, basically, for acting and for the arts. And there I was at the school, and the joke is, the harder I worked, the better everyone else got. It, I, mean, it, I, I just tried so hard that in a way I was, I was hurting myself. I just, I wanted it so much, and I tried so hard. And I heard once um, from an actor, Oliver Platt, when we were on tour for Pieces of April, the Washington Post was doing an interview of us and said to Oliver, what's the truest thing about acting that you know? And he said, oh, it's the only thing I know. And he said that if I'm working too hard, I'm doing something wrong. And I was doing something wrong. I was trying so hard. I mean, I, I'm telling you, no kid ever wanted to be an actor more than me. So I'm in the middle of my junior year, and I realize I've made a terrible mistake. I'm at this school. I've, I've, you know how they say, don't put all your eggs in a basket? I, every egg imaginable I'd put in this basket. And so I called up my father, and I was in te really a mess. And I'm weeping on the phone, and I said, you need to come get me. You need to take me away from college. Please come get me. And he said, well, what's wrong? And I said, they're killing It's horrible. I made a big mistake to bring me home. And um, he actually gave me the advice he gives uh, people who are suicidal, basically, because he's a minister and he gets a lot of calls at night. Somebody might call and say, I want to kill myself. And, and he would say to them, well, you know, that, that may be a good idea. Um, maybe he doesn't say it like that but, but the spirit of it was not he's not going to say don't do that he was going to say why don't you take some time why don't you step back you know and take, take a so what he basically said was look I'll come get you I'm happy to come get you but before I come get you I want you to try to do something positive to change your situation so I kind of calmed down. I went, all right, all right, something positive. And, and he said, if you do that something positive thing and it doesn't work, I'm in the car right away. But you have to do that positive thing to change your situation. Life-changing moment, didn't know it, because what happened was I hung up the phone and I looked around and I, I, I had a classmate who was in more pain than I was. A girl in my class was really suffering. But I thought she was a brilliant actress, and I thought no one knew it. And I decided, 
uh, this was another thing. Actually, this was my mother who was a drug and alcohol counselor. She had this advice when somebody was about to use again. Huh, interesting. Parents are big tonight. Um, it's funny how smart they get when you get older. You know, they, you may not think they're very smart. No, they, get br they get more brilliant every year um, for me. But my mom used to say to her clients who were really down and blue, they'd call up. And I learned this at her funeral, actually. Someone said to me that he that he called her once and he was so blue and so blue and she said okay here's what you're going to do you're going to go out right now and you're going to find somebody in worse shape than you and you're going to help them so she didn't spend any time she didn't had no interest in how he was suffering she said you go find somebody else who's suffering more so how that ties in to this was in my own way uh, i went and wrote a play never written a play. I wrote a play for my friend to be in. And the only goal in my play was that it showed the faculty how great she was. I didn't think about being a good writer. I just wrote a play for her. And that went pretty well. And then I got a grant to produce the works of student plays, of, of student, student playwrights and dancers and musicians. I got this grant and I asked people to create work and nobody was creating work. And I went, oh my gosh, I've got to create plays for this grant, because we were lucky to get this tiny grant, and I wrote a play for three friends to show off how good they were, and when that play was done at my college, my senior year, there was actually almost a riot on campus when the play was done, and, and I didn't even know the play was funny. I had no idea. We, we were just putting it up, and we put it up, and it started to play. People started laughing and laughing, and I, it was surreal. I was, out, I was like an out-of-body experience. I went, oh my gosh. This play is having more of an impact than any play I've ever been in as an actor. So it was just clear that I was, maybe I, I, I was supposed to be in the theater, but I was supposed to be a writer. So, so then I, I became a playwright, and I moved to New York, and I started writing plays for my friends. And it would be as if, you know, in my college I went to school with some wonderful actors. One, you may know who Mary Louise Parker is, if you ever heard of her. She's on Weeds on television and she was in Fried Green Tomatoes. And uh, another guy in my class was named Joe Mantello. He directed Wicked on Broadway. He's now kind of the biggest theater director in America. But they were my class. It was like I'm going to school with you. You know, we're going here, and they were just in class with me. And they, they didn't have any job when they got out of school, so I wrote plays for them. And we were all poor, and they, I was just writing plays for them. In fact, I'd call them up and say, what are you doing in April? And they'd go, why? And I'd go, I just rented a theater. Do you want to be in a play? And they'd go, yeah, what's it called? And I said, I don't know. I got to figure out who's going to be in it, and then I'll write it. So I would write the play, but it was crazy. It didn't make any sense, except we had each other. So, I, so anyway, so I did this for a number of years, completely poor, did all sorts of odd jobs. I'm trying to tell this quickly. Because then I had my next big setback, but it was preceded by kind of a big success that I wrote this one play for two women. I wrote it very quickly. After a year of not really writing it, I, I had a title for a year, and I'd walk around saying I'm writing a play called Imagining Brad. But I, I, it, was, it might have been, well, have been called Imagining a Play because I had no idea what it was about. And, and um, then a play came to me, and that's its own interesting story, but I'm going to skip it, to say then uh, Joe, at that point, was so tired of only acting in my plays and not making any money that he said, I think I'd like to direct. Do you have anything? And I said, oh, I just wrote a play for two women, and since you're in all my plays, maybe you should look at that one. And he said, yeah, I'll do it. He said, you haven't even read it. No, I just I got to direct. So he directed a little workshop of this play. For a brief moment, it became all the rage in my little world. And a lot of my hero playwrights came to see it, and it looked like this was the big moment. And of course, it, um, it premiered off Broadway, and I, the New York Times called me the Phil Donahue of playwrights. He was the guy before Oprah, so it was not really a compliment to be the Phil Donahue of playwrights. And the New Yorker, I'll never, you, you remember reviews like this, the critic said, she wanted to revoke all funding for the arts after seeing my play. She wanted to burn the theater down. Yes. So I was a little sad uh, <laughs> after that. I was a little blue. But interestingly enough, and this is how I came to write fiction. So here you go. I'm teaching around that time. I'm teaching at Northwestern University in a summer theater program. I walk into a playwriting class, my first, 
And at this point, the only plays I've done are the plays with my friends. And nobody knows who Mary Louise Parker is yet, so I can't say this girl who's going to be a big star is, was in my plays. I can't say that. But I can say um, when I walk into this class, I go, hi, I'm really nervous. I'm going to teach. I'm your playwriting teacher. And somebody almost, and this is not to point you out because you're a lovely man, but literally with your body language, I'm talking about the man in the fifth, the fifth person in this row, you, sir, with the nice red collar, literally sitting like that, like that, and he looks at me and he says, Mr. Hedges, first of all, I'm 23, so he's calling me Mr. Hedges. It's like, please, really, I'm, I'm, I'm not gray yet, just back off, you can call me Peter. He says, Mr. Hedges, what, if anything, have you written? The words, if anything, changed my life, because I went, if anything, I thought, hmm, this kid is pissing me off. <laughs> so I, this is what I said to him. I said, oh, well, let me tell you what I'm going to do. Tonight, I'm going to go back to the dorm room, and I'm going to write a monologue that I'm going to memorize tomorrow night, and I'm going to perform it Sunday at the faculty recital, and I'm going to dedicate it to you. So the next Monday, when I walk into this class, you won't be able to say, Mr. Hedges, what, if anything, have you written? The rest of the class was like, whoa, <laughs> that's so cool. And I was like, yes, I'm a stud. And the guy, the guy kind of went like, oh, oh, no, no, no. And, and then, of course, I had to do it. And I went back to the dorm room and I was so angry because, you know, and what I found early on in my career, this was a pattern. I'd say, I've rented a theater. Do you want to be in the show? And they'd say, I'm in the show. And then I'd have to write the show. So I created, when I was younger, situations where I had to produce. And, and I learned a lot. And the shows were sometimes good and sometimes they were terrible. I wrote one play all about penguins. This was before March of the Penguins. And it was all about the m melting of the ozone. And my company, they did everything. They did every play I wrote and we did a reading. I'm so proud of singing penguins and the melting icebergs. We read the play. I was like, what did you guys think? And they literally said, no. I said, I'm sorry. Jo I'll never forget Joe Mantello going, I'm not going to play a penguin. I may look like a penguin. <laughs> I will never be a penguin. Anyway, the point is that, and, and I think this is useful, that I, um, where was I? I, I? So I did the monologue. Um, I wrote it. I had to write it. I wrote it. I did it. It went quite well. And then I thought, oh, I'm going to turn this into a play for my theater company. In fact, the problem with my theater company was we were all young. So I thought I had one actress in my company who had a big head. And I said, this is, I have a great idea. I'm going to create a mother who's really heavy. And I'm going to have a window. And I'm going to put a gray wig on her because she's young. And she, this is so embarrassing. She's going to stick her head out in the window and go, Arnie, Gilbert? And they're going to describe how big she is, but you'll never see her. You'll just see her head. I don't know what I was thinking. But this, was my, I, this is how I came up with Mama Grape because I thought, I need an adult, but this is how I'll do it. So I wrote 120 pages in a notebook in purple ink because oh it was called the piece was called going places with Gary Gilbreth but at the last minute I had to rename it because I didn't like the name Gary Gilbreth I came up with the name Gary Grape but I was talking to a kid and he said no I like grape but not Gary and I said what about Gilbert Grape so I do this monologue then I try to turn it into a play then I realize that I I don't really like it as a play I don't want it to be a play what I love what I love is I love Gilbert's voice I love how he talks he had a great I just, he was so much fun to let him talk. And I'd stay up late at night and I was doing every temp job and living on people's floors and moving all that. I moved 20 times in these years, all the time. And I had no money, no health insurance, but I, I had this story and I just kept talking and talking with Gilbert. And I did this for about four years. And it eventually turned into a novel. But when it really got me to finish it as a novel, I gave up on it as a novel until I read that the New Yorker wanted to revoke all funding for the arts and wanted to burn the theater down. Because I thought I was going to be the next major American playwright. And I thought, I'm not going to ever let a critic do that to me again. So I thought, oh, this is a good idea. I'll write a novel. And I'm going to finish my novel. So I sat down and I finished my book. 
And uh, it took me many months, but I finished it. And then there's the whole story of how it got published, which is his own little story. And, um, and then, anyway, and on it went. And then it became a movie, and I can tell that story, too. There are so many stories. But I'm trying to give you some sense that I didn't expect when I was you to be me. And I'm not saying you want to be me, but I'm just saying the you you think you're going to be or the, think you should be, the, the you you should be may not be the you you become. And the you you become may be a little more interesting than you could have ever imagined. And that's been my experience, and it's been my experience with a lot of my friends, that they thought they were going to be actors, and they became doctors or lawyers or mothers, fathers. Or in Joe's case, he became a major director. And, and sometimes the success isn't so much in, the, in how the world views you, but it's in your finding your place in the world. I was fortunate that my dad said to me, try to do something positive to change your situation. And it was good that I threw everything at what I thought I wanted to do. Because the people I know, in my experience, who always had one foot in and always had something to fall back on, they fell back. And I never had anything to fall back on. So that when I was lost, I was really lost. But something always has come along that has surprised me. For instance, I vowed after a very bad date with an actress that I would never date another actress. A week later, I met an actress, and she's now my wife. So I, I can literally just go and go and go and tell you story upon story of that kind of experience, where every time I set out to do something, something else happens. Um, I want to tell you one other story, and it's a bit of a jump. And um, I don't know how many of you know my little movie called Pieces of April, but I made it with Katie Holmes and Patricia Clarkson. We shot that movie for $300,000. We shot it with video cameras that are worse than any video camera than any of you own. You, c you can get better picture quality with your iPhone than with the movie we made. And you live in a very unusual time where you can self-publish in ways you couldn't self-publish before. There's the software to you know, make films on your computer. It, it's it's you know it's astonishing what what you have that w we didn't have. Um, anyway, when I uh, uh, do you want to hear the story of what uh, piece? Of, uh, we could go to questions. We can go to questions because it's a long story, and then there won't be any time for questions. And I really am here for you. I mean, I am free. I'm very cheap. Um, <laughs> And, and, and it, it's a better night for me if I feel like I was helpful to you. And I, as you can see, I'll talk till, till I fall over. But, but one of you may have a question, and I may be able to help you. It, it, you're pointing out, oh, we, we, we kind of like to Jerry Springer it, or Oprah it. So we've got Andy. Thank you, Andy. From Lincoln, Nebraska, I might add. But you're still welcome here in Iowa um, with a microphone. So you just raise your hand, and he runs to you. So um, Andy's a fine young man. He's a freshman. Agriculture's his major. And uh, he'd like to know you. So um, anybody? Question? Yes, over there. Run, Andy. Run. Run. We don't want to miss a moment. Run. Yes. Yes. No. I, I just love answering okay. questions before they're asked. No, not at all. I was wondering, when you started doing stuff, did you ever have trouble getting people to show up to events? And like, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with people not showing up at your events? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I can tell you some stories of some pretty small crowds. Um, you know, uh, one of the, uh, this is what I tell my kids, one of the ways you are a friend, I was just explaining this to my son, he says, I don't have any friends. Well, one of the ways that you are a friend you, 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 uh, is to be a friend. So, so in, in that respect, I, um, you know, I, I just went to a lot of other people's work. And, you know, I support, encouraged and supported a lot of other people. Um, and, you know, because I had these other people I was working with, we, we, you know, we, we wouldn't do many performances. But we would um, advertise. We'd keep our ticket prices low. And, you know, we'd, we'd stand out on the street. We, we, I remember we did one show at the Quaig Theater in New York. And here's Mary Louise Parker, 21 years of age. 
it was a lunchtime show, and the only people who came to the play were homeless people and rats. There were honestly rats running through the theater. And, and we even performed on Thanksgiving Day. We're, I sent Mary Louise out on the street. She's very pretty. She'd be out on the street, come see my play. Come see my play. And she, you know, boys would be like, yeah, hey, I'll go see your play. And so, you know, so get a cute girl. And, um, <laughs> but I think the main thing is, is that, you know, you just... I, I have found in my life that I have uncommon strength when I, I have a great love. So if you do work that you love and you're proud of, it, it may not be perfect. In fact, particularly, it, it's not going to be. Everything made by a human is imperfect. You know, that's just how it works. So if you have that great love for it, it, there's a, that moment in Pieces of April, it's probably an urban myth, but I love this notion that the car flips over and a mother's child is under the car. And the mother, of course, you know, would not be able to pick up a car, but because her child is under the car, she can pick up the car. And I have found that, because I'm not a guy who likes conflict, I'm not a guy who likes to sell and go out and go like, hey, come see my thing, but I can do a lot of things, you know, short of hideous crimes that I could be put in jail for. I can do almost anything on behalf of something I love. And the fact of the matter is, if you feel that about what you've done, it's probably pretty good. At least you had to make it. It was, you know, Rilke wrote, all art is necessary, you know. And, and, and it, it, if it's necessary for you to make and you've done your work, then you go out and you go. But, you know, look, the world's littered with, uh, late in his career, Roy Orbison played the Iowa State Fair, I think, to 300 people. I mean, Roy Orbison, with a, with a, a, with a tape playing behind him, one of the greatest singers of all time. I mean, Van Gogh didn't sell a painting. I mean, on and on it goes. But he did have Gauguin, and he had a circle of people around him. He had his brother. And, you know, look, it was a hideous end there. But if you read his letters... You can, you know, so I would, I would also look to the people that weren't understood in their time and take some solace in that, like, hey, nobody came to my work. Well, nobody bought a painting by Van Gogh. That <laughs> may give you, you know, may help you feel good. But I think it's, it's your passion for it, your belief in it. That will carry you. That's, that's the best I can do. Was, was that helpful? I Any? was wondering about, like, actors showing up, though, if you schedule it with an actor. Or... Oh, actors showing yeah, up? Yeah, not with the well, audience. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing I found about actors. So you're talking about like writing a play and getting actors yeah. to be in it? Yeah. Well, the thing I learned early on was that if I gave actors, if I asked them to be penguins in a musical, they weren't going to come. <laughs> but if I put something on the page that, they, that gave them a chance to do something they normally didn't get to do, you know, Oliver Platt says acting's free. It's the waiting that you pay for. You know, because on movies you wait a lot. But actors, so, so the, real, the real test for me is if I've written something and I can't get anybody to be in it, it's a pretty good sign that there's something wrong with what I've written. I just spent four years on a script. I was really having trouble attracting an actor. This script I wrote, they offered Jack Nicholson $20 million to be in it. And he said, no, there's a problem with my script. Okay? Because $20 million and I can't get Jack Nicholson... There's something wrong. I don't know what it is. If you want to read it and figure it out for me, I'll split my deal with you. But, but, but anyway, that doesn't always mean it. You know, sometimes it's finding the right person. But that, I think it's giving an actor an opportunity to do something they don't normally get to do. That's why Katie Holmes came and worked for nothing on Pieces of April, because she knew she was going to get to do something that people, you'd see her in it maybe in a different way. And so you, 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 you play on people's ambition and their desire to do good work. And my experience is most artists want to be in something that they believe in. So I hope that was helpful. Okay? Thank you for your brave question. Anyone else? Yes. Yes. Run, run, run. Sorry. He's very good. Oh, no. Just pass the mic. Pass it down. Kumbaya. <laughs> I'd like to hear you talk about the uh, really first-rate novelists whose work you've uh, converted into screenplays, Jane Hamilton and oh. Nick Hornby, and did you get to work with them? And right. Well, uh, Jane Hamilton, I had a no oh, 
I'm losing them. It's all right. It's all right. That's good. They're, believe me. You know what you need. Go get it. Um, Jane Hamilton, I spent a, had a number of conversations with. That was a book I loved. One of my happiest moments was I said, boy, you know, your book's really hard to adapt. And she said, why? I said, because I felt like I could write four different movies. And she said, that's funny because I wrote four different books. She said, when I was writing the book, it was four different times. Uh, she, she read the drafts and gave, you know, and was very kind. It's, you know, the movie is nowhere near as good as the book in that instance, I'm afraid. We, we did the best we could, but the book's really beautiful. Nick Hornby I spent a lot of time with. He took me all over London. He bought me a lot of music. He introduced me to, uh, what's that? Oh, great. Oh, such a great band. Um, so many bands. I mean, he knows more about music than anybody on earth. And he's just a lovely gentleman. And, and uh, my, I would try to be very true to his book. I kept the Nirvana subplot, which I think was so beautiful. I kept it in the time. The only thing I did, because the studio asked me, was I made Hugh Grant's character an American at first. That's why they hired an American. And then we wanted to turn him back. I, you know, why wouldn't this be great for Hugh Grant? So I was getting ready to turn it back to a British character for Hugh Grant when the director I was writing for said, he was British, said, I don't want Hugh Grant to be in the movie. Because the British don't like, this particular British man doesn't like Hugh Grant the way we do. You know, it's just whatever. So anyway, so in true to form, they fired the director. You know, I kind of thought <laughs> that that might happen. And they did, and then... When they fired that director, they brought on the Whites Brothers, who are rather accomplished writers. And it just seemed to me that if they're going to come on and direct the movie, if I were them, I would want to write the script, you know, take my script and write their script. So they took what I'd written and made it really their own. So I actually met them at the Academy Awards luncheon. You know, I didn't, it, which was fine. I mean, I, they were very respectful, they were kind, they always said nice things about me. But it was theirs. It's their movie. And I know they couldn't have done their work without my work, but I really think if you loved that movie, you, you, if you were to meet, if all three of us were standing here, you should go up to them and thank them first, you know. Um, but I love Nick's writing, and it's, you know, I think it helped me become a better novelist to get to work on books. I also have been adapting a novel by Jonathan Tropper called Everything Changes, which is a really beautiful novel that I spent a lot of time on. I was the first screenwriter on Devil Wears Prada. I never say that, but I was. I did two and a half drafts, and I actually was in line to direct it. And I was in that meeting with Oliver Platt, and we were touring for Pieces of April, and I was rewriting Devil Wears Prada. I was on my third draft, which is a big deal when you get to the third draft, because that means they're paying you more than they promised you would they pay you. And Oliver Platt were in that meeting, and they said, what's the truest thing you know about acting? And he said, if you're working too hard, you're doing something wrong. And I went, ugh. And the Washington Post reporter said, what is it? And I said, I, I need to leave. for I'll be back. And I left, and I called my agent, and I said, you need to give me the words. And he said, what do you mean? I said, you need to give me the words. I have to leave Devil Wears Prada. I've worked and worked and worked, and the movie I want to make is not in line with the movie they want me to make. And... My agent, we crafted a five-sentence statement that I could announce, that I could say, and I read it over the phone because I knew they would try to talk. You do, they'd talk, and I'm, I'm weak enough that I'd be like, okay, I'll try again. But I read it, and when I read it to my producer, she said, well, there's nothing I can say to that. And basically, I just said, I, I love this project so much, and, what I'm, and I was trying to do something a little different for me because you don't, I mean, you don't think Devil, Peter Hedges and Devil Wears Prada. Well, first of all, you probably don't think Peter Hedges at all. But if you were to think Peter Hedges, you certainly don't go, Devil Wears Prada, boom. And when I signed on, it was a title and an outline. I mean, it was just an idea. So I was writing a script in the book. I didn't even have a book. You know, I'm kind of going off some outline. But anyway, um, so I walked, you know, I walked off Devil Wears Prada. They didn't ask me to leave. I left because I was working too hard too hard and um, you know obviously it became just a huge success and uh, I would be wearing much nicer clothes if I'd stayed on Devil Wears Prada. I don't think my version of the movie would have been as popular. I think it would have been kind of special um, but and that's not a knock on what they did. I thought Meryl Streep was great and it's really delightful and fun but uh, so, so I've worked on 
I've done those things. And all the while I was working on, on the heights. Because as a writer, I always have something I'm working on that's not for sale, that nobody can have. And because I looked around my world of screenwriters, and I see sometimes a lot of uh, helplessness. In novelists, too, we feel like nobody's reading what I'm doing, no things being sold. And I feel like one of our jobs is to keep bitterness at bay. Because, uh, you know, nobody asks you to, to be a writer. You know. And the fact is, you know, I, if I stopped writing today, there'd be some few people who'd go like, oh, that's really too bad. But the world really isn't going to, like fall apart if Peter Hedges doesn't write again. So it really means that I have to have this deep need to tell a story and hopefully the stories I tell will be useful. Hopefully they'll lighten the world a bit or bring some kind of meaning to somebody. Um, and uh, anyway, that I, I now I'm off onto a whole other topic. Since I write novels and, and yes, and I'm also an accomplished mime, but go ahead. <laughs> Was I imagining it as a screenplay? Uh, no, I wasn't. Now that said, I closed a deal last week to make a film of it that I'm writing and directing and producing. But I did not think of it as a film. I truly thought of it as a novel. The book, a lot of the best parts of the book are how they think. And the fun part of writing a novel, and I mean, when I mean fun, it's not like I'm sitting there at work going, woo hoo But the, the pleasure of writing a novel and working in these different forms is to understand what each form like to exploit in the best sense what each form offers you. A play is that ability to have people have a kind of conversation which we increasingly have less and less of because people are on Facebook and texting and calling and you know, when do you really sit and talk? Jury duty, uh, stuck in an elevator, you know, there aren't a lot of places where we actually have sustained conversation anymore, you know, a family holiday. So uh, that's what you do in a play. But in a novel, it was the thought. And because I wanted to write about a marriage and explore the two points of view, the husband and the wife, and what each of them know and what happens when one of them stops telling the other everything or trying to tell each other everything, that how they think a lot of the tension in the book is what's thought about. So while there is a kind of a good story to it and they're about halfway through something happens which kind of gets you turning the pages so people go oh he's a movie guy so it must be a movie it's going to be a very hard a much harder adaptation if you write screenplays you'd know that but if you don't you would think oh yeah that's probably a movie so no I didn't really think of it as a movie although my experience of turning Gilbert Grape from a book into a movie was so good and the book is so much its own thing and the movie is its own thing that I'm clinging to that hope that that will be the case here, that the book will have its own life. The, you know, it's just, the truth is just many more people go to movies than go, than, than read books. But, um, you know, it's not really a numbers business either because, you know, sometimes just reaching a, a handful of people in a profound way is a lot more interesting than reaching a bunch of people and they, f they forget what you did because that sometimes happens too. Anyway. Yes, sorry. Hello. Hi. Um. That's really loud. Um, I got a question. Like, I mean, like you hear a lot of producers and uh, directors say, like that, uh, um, like the Hollywood industry is dead because you have like technology, you got clicks and Twitter, and um, you got Netflix, and uh, like, you know, we're all sitting here in like this wooden box in Iowa, and like, what's the first step to getting out of here and like having someone listen to you? Like, sort of like what you're talking about. Like, nobody talks to anybody anymore. It's like this is my click and this is who I'm staying with. Like, how do I get them to listen to me? Great question. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, here's what I, this may be the most naive thing you'll ever hear a 47-year-old say, but I really believe that our elemental need for story is, it's so in our DNA. And the only thing that's changing is how we experience story. But we need stories. And there are going to be periods of time, there always have been, where, you know, if you study the 19th century, where everybody went and saw the freak shows, you know, and that was all big. But, but the freak shows didn't last, but Shakespeare lasted. Moliere lasted. Ibsen, Chekhov lasted. 
I think the best chance you got is to have something to say. That you have a story that you need to tell. That, and here's the truth, sometimes you need to tell it, but nobody else needs to hear it. And that's a hard moment. I cite, once again, my classic play, Penguin Lake. <laughs> you know, I needed to write Penguin Lake. It was so important to me. I was ahead of March of the Penguins. I, I literally envisioned March of the Penguins. A friend of mine wrote, rewrote, reconceived March of the Penguins, you know, and he did it in 10 days. And before that, he'd spent 10 years writing a movie that he wrote and directed that no one saw and he was ev eviscerated for. And in his grief, somebody said, look, I need help. Would you rewrite this documentary where the penguins are talking in French, singing in or something. They're talking from their point of view. Would you? And he spent 10 days on it, and it you know, became the highest grossing documentary in history. And what's my point? My point is having that thing to say. And the fact is, you can look at it and go, oh gosh, we're not going to experience movies the same way. My, I bought my son, my 13-year-old genius of a son, a wonderful kid, uh, just had to have an iPad, you know, and w there we got it the first day. And he, he started it, and within, within minutes, he had a movie of mine playing on the iPad, and he downloaded my new novel on the iPad. And he could go from the movie, playing, pause it, and then read a page of my book, which he's not allowed to read because it's not appropriate for you. Do you understand? You're not to read it. I know you want to. I saw you looking at it, but don't. Anyway, so, but, so really the thing is, is to n don't get too worried that it's changed. That the way we distribute story is changing. You know, a lot of you, you know, in future generations, this, people are going to look at actual books. They'll still exist. But a lot of people are going to experience books through a Kindle or, I, I actually, I think it's going to be an iPad. iPads are going to trump the Kindle. It's astonishing. And, and, you know, some people go, that's horrible. That's horrible. Well, maybe not. Now, I think watching Lawrence of Arabia on, an, on, an, on a little eye, you know, screen that big, that's pretty tragic. I mean, David Lynch would be spinning in his grave. You know, you want to see that. And I think movies are, are, in a sense, losing their prestige because more and more people are experiencing them. You know, you can watch, I, I found out, I can't believe it, you can go on YouTube and watch Pieces of April in 10 pieces. You know, I don't know why the lawyers aren't shutting that down. I mean, but, but and then there's another part of me that's like, well, it, it, it's a, at least it's a way to experience it. But the thing is having the story, having the thing that you have to say. And that, is tw that takes 20, you know, you're going you're gonna to write Penguin Lake and no one's going to want to be in it. And then you're going to write that thing in a day. And, you know, Dan in real life for me. I never wanted to make Dan in real life, and I'm not a victim. I mean, it's not like they, they held a gun to my head. I rewrote a script. because I, I, After Devil Wears Prada happened, and I walked away, I thought, I'm going to work on my book. I'm going to finish my book. Well, I started working on my book, and I panicked. I went, oh, the book's not working. I've got to get a job. And a buddy called me up and said, I want you to write a script about a con, rewrite a script of mine about a con man. So I said, I'll do it. So I started to rewrite the script about a con man. I was going to work for four weeks, get paid pretty well, four weeks. For four weeks, I played video games, and I don't even play video games. I, I went and did the skeet shoot. Now, I, I was doing everything but not writing, eating, eating a lot of good food. And at four weeks, I said, I, don't, I had no idea what to do. I couldn't even understand the mind of a con man. It wasn't in my wheelhouse. I was like writing the wrong movie. So I called up Disney and I said, you know what? I have to give you your money back. I've made a terrible mistake. And now, you know, now I'm not on Prada, which at least I had an idea for, and I'm writing about a con man. I made a terrible mistake. So I'm going to give you your money back. Money, I've got to be honest, I didn't really have, but I, I couldn't in good conscience, you know, I needed to give them back what they paid me. And the head of Disney said, no, I'm not taking your money back. No. I've wanted to work with you. I'm sending you a box of scripts. And you pick one of these. These are scripts we don't know what to do with. You pick one of them. And you work on it for four weeks. And you turn it in. So, okay. You know, it was, all right. They sent me a box of scripts. There were eight or nine of them in. The second script I read was called Dan in Real Life. It was 
pretty different from what you ultimately saw if you saw it. But the idea was there, and I thought, I could help this. I could help this for four weeks. Well, I didn't work on it for four weeks. I worked on it for five months. And the only thing I did was I worked on it every morning until it was unpleasant. So some days I'd work on it for five minutes. Some days I'd work on it for five hours. And the minute it got unpleasant or painful, I stopped. And then I worked on my book. So my wife keeps saying, I thought you were going to work on this for four weeks. Say, oh, it's coming, it's coming. And then now she'll see this video and go, oh, great. Now I know the truth. But I would be working on my book. But I worked on it, worked on it, worked on it. Then I turned it in. After about five months, I turned to my assistant. I said, I think it's ready. She said, yeah, I think it's ready. So we turned it in. And uh, next thing I knew, the head of the studio called up and said, I greenlit the movie. I said, oh, that's, uh, really? Really? Oh, that's great. And um, you can cast whoever you want. I said, no, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not directing this. I'm not. Oh, no, no. I'm going to make a very important movie for Focus Features. I have a great idea, very ambitious. Yeah, well, that's great. You can do that. But, but I'm, I, I really think you should direct this movie. No, 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 no. You can cast who you want. I go, yeah, right. Sure. That's really true. No, no, you can't. You can't. But I have a deal at Focus. They're going to, oh, no, no, I'll call them up. I'm going to let them do the foreign of the movie so that we'll split it. You can make the movie with Disney and Focus. She did it. She called up. Focus said, that's great. Yeah, we'll do that. And I didn't expect to direct it. But, and I was stunned. I was really stunned that they wanted to make it. I thought I had improved it. But I, to me, it wasn't enough to make a movie. So then I kept rewriting and rewriting. And then I said, can I cast this guy from a TV show that's about to come out called The Office? And he's in this movie called The 40-Year-Old Virgin. And they said, really, him? Well, that was after we'd offered it to Tom Hanks and Tom Cruise. I mean, you know, to all the people who you would offer a movie to that you think you have to have. And they, of course, said no. And then I said, what about this guy? And they said, yeah, that'd be great. And we got him. And then I said, how about... You know, after a interviewing every actress in America that doesn't make $10 million, how about Juliette Binoche? They said, yeah, that's great. Really. Um, I want a 23-year-old Norwegian singer-songwriter named Sandre Lerka to score the movie. How's that sound? Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you, this is the last story. When I was a young man in high school, I wanted to go to prom with Brenda Jensen. Uh, you're wondering where this story's going. But I so wanted to go to prom with Brenda Jensen. And I did everything I could to get Brenda Jensen to go to prom with me. And she didn't. This, I'm going to end with this story, and then we'll go to the next. But she didn't go to prom with me. I asked her, and she said, Peter, no. I like you, but not in that way. And I was pretty upset. And she said, but you know what? Catherine Idol wants to go to prom with you. And I think you should ask her. And I really liked Catherine Idol. She was great. She was an alto. Brenda was soprano, um, choir. But, you know, I just, I, I, what I couldn't bear was the thought of being at prom. Because Brenda went with Jay Engel, of course, our class president. I'm speaking to Jay Brown, my classmate, my buddy. And, uh, and I said, I can't go to prom and then look over and see Brenda laughing with Jay. That's, that's just going to be too painful for me. So I didn't go to prom. And I went to my 10-year high school reunion. And they asked us, what would you do if you could do high school over again? I said, read more, study harder, go to prom. I don't know why. I just think I really missed out on something. Well, I'm at this reunion. I see Brenda, and it's lovely, and we say hi. And I'm just talking. And at this point, I've just sold Gilbert Grape as a novel. I've rented a red Mustang. My hair's kind of Kate Jackson length. She was the smart angel down to here. I actually now have pubic hair. I've kind of grown up. I'm feeling pretty good. <laughs> and I look over, you know, across the room and I see in the light, you know, under the mirror ball, this woman. And I go, huh. Oh. And I go, wow. Who's? And I look and I squint and I walk over and I go, Catherine? She goes, Peter. And she's beautiful. And she's happily married. And she says, how are you? And I say, how are you? She tells me about her life. She has a wonderful life. I've just met the woman I'm going to marry. You know, I did, wasn't at that point, but that's what ended up happening. And we're talking, and I go, um, oh, wow, this is hard. And, and I kind of tear up, and she says, what's the matter? And I said, well, you know, 
you know that I wanted to go to prom with Brenda. She says, yeah, I know. And did you know that Brenda told me to ask you? She said, yeah, I know. And uh, I said, well, I, I, I just couldn't go to prom with you and look over and see Brenda happy with Jay Engel. And uh, she said, oh, I understand. And I said, but I, I got to just tell you that um, I'm, I'm standing here right now tonight. And, you know, I'm not a person that wants to regret. I mean, I, I have a great fear of regret. I don't want to regret. In fact, my life has been fueled by not wanting to regret because I don't want to be the guy late in life going, I wish I'd done this. I mean, figure out what it is you wish you'd done and do it, honestly, because you, you don't know. You don't know how, we don't know how much time we have. I have too many friends have died in very bad ways, suddenly, slowly, and I, I, you know, I just know life is precious. And I'm sitting here and I'm saying, you know, I don't have many regrets. I really don't. But I got to tell you, Catherine, I feel like such an asshole because I wish more than anything, standing here right now tonight, I had gone to prom with you. I had asked you to prom. And she was so sweet and she kind of teared up too and she said, yeah. We would have had fun. And uh, so Catherine Idol's why I directed Dan in real life. Because I was waiting to go to prom with Brenda Jensen. And they kept coming back and saying, it was Catherine coming back saying, hey, you want to do this? And I thought, you know what? Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go with it. And some of it, so what I'm telling you is, I had the story I thought I had to make. No one wanted me to make it. And I did everything I could to get it made. Nah, it wasn't to be, or it's not that time. And then I wrote another thing that I didn't think so much of that other people responded to. And it's not that I let other people dictate what I'm going to do, but at a certain point, if you're working too hard, you're doing something wrong. I mean, it's delicate because if you also don't work hard enough, nothing happens. So you have to kind of figure out what's too hard and what's not hard enough. I mean, that's life kind of tells you. I want to tell you one other story. It's a parent story. It's for anybody here who's a parent. Because when we were on the set of Gilbert Grape, my father was in the movie. He plays the Lutheran minister. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie, but there's a funeral in the movie and there's this Lutheran minister. Well, my dad's an Episcopal priest. And, uh, and I said to him, Dad, do you want to be in the movie? But you, got to play a Luth- you have to play a Lutheran minister. And he said, uh, yeah, I, I, I can do Lutheran. Yeah, I could do that. And I said, he said, I, I just won't be as interesting. <laughs> wow, that was good. Anyway, so we're on the set. We're on the set of Gilbert Grape, and we're doing, um, he, he's there doing makeup. He's actually in the makeup trailer. This is hard to believe. With Leonardo DiCaprio, who's 17, 18 at the time. Just turned 18 when we were filming. And they're, they're in this, he, Leonardo's here, and he was such, just... He's kind of like you, just a little older, just really fun. You just loved him. He just lit up every room. He's such a great guy. And there he is. And my dad, you know, from, from Hedrick, Iowa, sitting there with soon to be one of the biggest movie stars in the world. And my dad says, uh, Peter, can I say something to you? And I go, yeah, yeah, I do. This is for the parents or when you become a parent. He said, yeah. He said, do you remember years ago when you told me that you were writing a novel? I said, Yeah. And he said, "Um, you know, when you told me back then you were writing a novel, do you know what I thought? I said, no. And he said, I thought to myself, it was the stupidest idea you've ever had. Now consider when he decided to tell me. On the set of the movie, of my book, where he was playing a Lutheran minister in a scene with Johnny Depp and Leonardo DiCaprio. I believe, I really believe, that if he had told me what he thought when I first had the idea, I might never have written the book. I never would have had the money to marry my wife, to have our children, to ultimately write this book and be standing here tonight. That's how other people can affect us. So don't tell your kids their ideas are bad. They may be bad. They may be terrible ideas. Don't tell them. Life will tell them. 
So in answer to your question, li- life is going to give you an idea of whether your story... But, but what I would say to you is this, that if you write something and you really believe in it and nobody thinks, nobody wants it, it doesn't mean that it's not useful and it doesn't mean it doesn't have value. It just may not be its time, you know. So don't, don't let... It's this tough thing because you have to believe in it, but you also... You know, we, we're not, we don't live in vacuums. You ever see that great Twilight Zone episode about the guy who read, read books and he just loved books and he was so excited that everybody in the world died and he had really thick glasses? It's just brilliant, you know. And he's so happy. He's just got books and he's going along until he steps on his glasses. And now he can't read books because he's got no one to fix his glasses. I don't know. I don't know why Rod Serling came to me. Good, <laughs> good storyteller. Uh, it's time. Time out. Cut it. The night is over. Go and sin no more. And we'd like to give another round of applause yes, to... Yes, really. Please. And remind you that there is a reception after and a book signing over here. And please stop and buy a book and ask him that special question. Okay? Thanks. Thanks.